In today's world, especially in the West, monarchy is looked upon as a quaint relic of the past at best, or a fundamentally repressive institution at its worst. But Catholicism has a deep relationship with monarchy, and some Catholics, including today's guests, argue that it is the best form of government possible. That's what we're going to talk about today on Crisis Point. Hello, I'm Eric Sammons, your host and the editor-in-chief of Crisis Magazine. Before we get started, just want to encourage people to uh, like this video uh, wherever you might watch it. Uh, subscribe to the channel. Let other people know about it. We always do appreciate that. Okay, let's go ahead and just get right into it. Our guest today is Charles Colomb. He is the, a contributing editor of Crisis Magazine. I want to lead with that because that's his most important uh, you know, a title right there is Contributing Editor of Crisis Magazine. He's also the author of many books. Uh, most recently, Blessed Charles of Austria, A Holy Emperor and His Legacy, which I have read and found excellent. And as I told uh, Charles before, my 13-year-old daughter is reading now and also is enjoying it. So thank you for, for writing that. Thanks for also for coming on the program, Charles. Well, thanks for inviting me. Good to be here. Yeah, so we're going to talk about monarchy. Now, I think for a lot of people... Defending monarchy against democracy is kind of like defending the horse and buggy versus cars or the typewriter versus a computer. It just seems something very uh, alien, an alien way of thinking to, I think, to, to most modern men and women. So why don't we first just make sure we're, we're talking about the same thing. We're defining our terms. We know what we're talking about. So why don't you first just say, why don't you define monarchy for us? Well, I, I, I shall. Uh, basically, there, there are, very, remember, there are many, many kinds of monarchies, just as there are many kinds of republics and many kinds of quote unquote democracies. Uh, Weimar Germany was a republic, so was Nazi Germany. The United States were a republic, so was the Republic of Venice. Um, these are, the Soviet Union was a republic, so were the United States. So, specifics are very important. Similarly, when you talk about democracy, I uh, always like to think of the joke back in the 70s. We used to say that in America and the Western Europe, we had representative democracy. Uh, in the Soviet Union, they had people's democracy. And Idi Amin defined cannibalism as nutritional democracy. <laughs> so you're, very, you're, you're really right about needing to define what we're talking about. Basically, monarchy is a form of government in which the head is usually, though not always, uh, chosen uh, by the virtue of birth, it's hereditary, uh, which as well is conceived to bring the hand of God into the question. Every monarchy, uh, regardless of the religion, will very openly claim that the ruler rules by the grace of God or the gods or whatever the son of heaven, the, the, you can't have an atheist or an agnostic monarchy. You, you have had monarchists who are, but the, the institution itself always looks to the heavens quite literally for legitimacy and authority. Now that's another concept that's very important, authority versus power. Authority is the right to say what ought to happen. Power is the ability to make it so. Now, monarchy is, of course, the most natural and traditional kind of government in world history. The Indian tribes of the Americas had it. Um, there are all sorts of sub-monarchies today throughout Africa and Asia, sultanates and so forth that continue underneath the Republican governments installed by the decolonizers. Those, but that's not really what I'm interested in, to be honest. Uh, you have major monarchies like the Ottoman Empire or the, the, the uh, Qing dynasty in China, which personally I really would not want to have lived under myself. <laughs> but I will just say in passing about those sorts of states that they were never replaced by anything better under Western influence. The idea of democracy in those places generally meant more people die. You see, everyone gets the right to die rather than just a few. <laughs> so, uh, but we'll set that aside because what really interests me uh, is monarchy in, as it's come to be expressed uh, in Christian countries. 
Right. So the um, idea, though, fundamentally, though, is the monarch, because in general, he or she is appointed by virtue of his or her birth, then that means there's a certain divine touch to it. There's something from the heavens, if you're not Christian, but we would just say that because God has selected this person, in a sense, rather than the people who selected the ruler. Is that, is that essentially get it right? Yeah, but there's a lot more to it than that when you look right. at the Christian element, because that's only part of it. Uh, one thing I, I really have to rush in here is that for most people, especially for Americans, when they think of monarchy, especially Catholic Americans, they think of Henry VIII. Right. That's the, he's always trotted out. He gets a lot more uh, press time now than he did when he was alive, I think. <laughs> but what people forget, two things. One, uh, he was as much a bending of the old Catholic monarchy as anything we have today is a bending of the Constitution of the United States. Secondly, we live under regimes today that are far more absolute than Henry VIII was capable of being. We happily accept, for the most part, a government that can redefine what marriage is and redefine the nature of the human being. Henry VIII had to pretend to go along with the law somehow or other. It was kind of twisted reasoning a lot of the time, but he had to do it. There was the admission that he was not absolute in the sense that our democratic regimes are. We live in absolute democracies as opposed to absolute monarchies. They're so absolute that if you don't believe me, get vaxxed and put your mask on. Otherwise, right. I'm afraid the virus will come through the phone. <laughs> but seriously, uh, having said all of that, uh, traditional Christian monarchy had four elements in common. Now, mind you, I'm wildly oversimplifying and I'm, I'm doing all sorts of fun stuff, but it's just to give you a proper place to look at it. Firstly, the monarch had authority, but in the, in the Catholic states, certainly in the Middle Ages and later, uh, power was diffuse. It's the opposite today. Authority is diffuse amongst the voters, but power is concentrated. And so we all obey like the good little dogs we are. But it was just the opposite for them. Um, and so you had these four elements. And what were they? Well, first, the altar. So the altar represented the church through, uh, through whose ministration legitimacy came to the king or the emperor, um, as symbolized by the coronation uh, and other, other symbolic acts. Um, but the church did more than that. It was the animating principle of society. It set the, the rules, as it were. Um, and of course, the salvation of souls, although that was primarily the role of the church, it was also seen as a secondary mission as well of the king. Which brings us to the second thing, the throne, and that's the role of the king. Uh, he was not a supreme master in the way that we like to think. Because power was diffuse, the church had some, the cities had some, etc., etc. A good king was like an orchestra leader. And when you had a bad king, you didn't, well, I could make life miserable for the people immediately around him. When you had a bad king, you didn't have despotism usually. What you had was anarchy and civil war. That was the great defect of the system. But no human system is perfect. And for a lot of the uh, a lot of time, a very long time. It worked more or less better than what we used to. That was the altar and the throne, but there were two other elements, which uh, we talk about today. One, they would have called local liberties, provincial rights, fueros, provincial customs, what we call today subsidiarity. That was a big, big part of the system. And the emperor or the king ruled not simply he ruled each of his peoples, each of his provinces, according to their own laws, which sometimes are very, very different. Uh, and similarly, the um, local government was much more powerful than we're used to today. This goes back to what I just said about a bad king to get anarchy. Uh, 
the fourth element uh, today we would call solidarity or um, the idea of the nation as a family with the, the king as the head, as the father of the family, quite literally, ready to die for it, it may be. And all of the different portions, the nobility, the church, the peasantry, etc., were all seen as fitting in as part of their specific place, as part of the whole. There's an old medieval image that I like very much. It shows a priest, a knight, and a peasant. And under the priest, it says either I pray for all or I bless all. Under the knight, it says I defend all. And under the peasant, it says I feed all. <laughs> so this, uh, and this was a concept that would later be revived after the French Revolution as the very basis of Catholic social teaching. The idea of applying that sort of class collabor cooperation that had with some rather unpleasant uh, exceptions, pretty much dominated in the Middle Ages, somehow applying it to the modern world. Right. And to enfolding, if you will, the um, urban proletariat into that structure. There was sort of a, a fifth element too, and that was the idea of all of the nations, all of the Christian nations as being vaguely part of a greater whole the Respublica Christiana, Christendom, and the idea that the emperor as senior monarch was in a sense at the head of the temporal side of things as the Pope was of uh, spiritual. And there again, that, that notion of the Respublica Christiana, it comes to us really, believe it or not, don't be shocked from the Last Supper. Interesting. Well, here's the concept anyway. Yeah, I want and, to hear this connection. Well, and as you know about concepts, they're very often not perfect in the actual application. Right. I know that's a shock to a 21st century person, <laughs> but it is true that sometimes the ideals of a society don't measure up to what they actually do. So let me just, but of course, some societies have higher goals than others do. The higher you aim, the more obvious your failures. If you aim very low, well, then who's to say whether you failed or not? Right. Anyhow, I digress. So, um, basically, at the Last Supper, amongst other things, the formation of the priesthood, the establishment of the sacrifice of the Mass, all that, uh, our Lord united the Davidic kingship, the kingship of Israel, to which he was rightful hereditary heir, we forget that. The son of David wasn't just poetry. He was the rightful heir of David and Solomon and all the kings of the Davidic line. And all the promises that were made to them and to Hezekiah and the rest of them, they were fulfilled in Christ. He united at that time the Davidic kingship with the communio of the church. And so from that time on, all of the uh, monarchs who would want to be Christian, to a greater or lesser degree, had to see themselves as somehow participating in the kingship of Christ, as, it, as being obligated to represent and to imitate him. Now, obviously, in the first couple of 100 years of the church's existence, this wasn't a big issue because there weren't any Catholic kings, and we were just illegal, and that was that. Right. But starting in the early 300s first with armenia georgia uh, not the one in the south but on the black sea georgia ethiopia and then finally in 380 with theodosius the great and the edict of thessalonica this was the beginning of the whole idea of catholic monarchy as i've described it right and it's interesting that theodosius as part of his uh, alterations didn't just make catholicism the original of the empire he made baptism entry into Roman citizenship. So when you were baptized, you weren't just a member of the Catholic Church, you were now also a Roman citizen. And from that time on, the church and the state slash the empire was seen as different facets of the same thing, distinct, distinct, but nevertheless connected. 
And so uh, it was a it was a system that um, well, let's put it this way: it was uh, a lot of a lot of the time it was perhaps more a platonic ideal right. than a hard and fast regulation. Uh, but it was an ideal that people strove to meet. And it was because of this, for instance, that when we had the great schism in the uh, uh, 1400s, 1300s, 1400s, there were three popes. And nobody could put the Humpty Dumpty of the papacy back together again. Who did it? Do you remember? Uh, it was the emperor. It was the emperor, Emperor Sigismund. Taking the example of uh, Emperor Constantine convoking the uh, Council of Nicaea, and similar. Well, wasn't it um, Otto who like fixed up the tried to fix up the pornocracy papacy yeah. Uh, yeah. in the tenth century? He got sure involved. Was. He sure did, and uh, and of course the the opposite was true too. When you had erring emperors, the Pope would get involved. Right. So and and one of the things you know you, you you've got to guard against is apart from seeing perfection in any historical arrangement, because you never, you'll never find it anywhere. In the immortal words of uh, uh, Judy Garland and the Wizard of Oz, <laughs> if, you haven't, if you haven't found it at home, then you never really lost it to begin with, or whatever she says, it's kind of incoherent. But seriously, um, the, the truth of the matter is that it worked a lot of the time. And its fruits, what were its fruits? A lot of saints, a lot of saintly rulers. You see, and this is one of the things that I, I always have to bring up when people have to bring up Henry VIII. You know, he always gets trotted out. Okay, that's nice. Why don't you look at the scores of royal saints and show me something to compare with on the other side? Hmm? Well, uh, uh, well, there haven't, uh, there, haven't, there haven't been republics all that long. Well, yeah, there's that too. You're right. There's that too. Ours is an inherently unstable system. And it may be, I pray God not, it may be that we are living in the beginning of the time it cracks. Right. Now, I sincerely hope not. Yeah, now let's. I want to get to that in a minute, but I also want to make sure we're clear about the different types of monarchy. Mm. So, of course, I know you know constitutional monarchy, absolute monarchy. I think there's some other ones that I'm not even. I can't remember right now. But so, why don't you make sure? Why don't you explain to us the difference between the different types of monarchy and which one is the one that you're saying is essentially the the most Catholic form of of monarchy? Well, what I, what I've described uh, basically the medieval monarchy more or less um with attempts to update it shall we say right. as the traditional catholic kind of monarchy a an, a, an, a uh an effective monarch who nevertheless is not quote unquote absolute okay uh, not a who's... constitutional monarchy well no no not a constitutional monarchy not in the sense that we think of it right. because the constitutional monarchies we're familiar with Britain, Canada, Scandinavia, etc. There, they're pretty much the product, uh, the ones that we have now, with the exception of Spain, uh, and that's kind of an imitation. I'd have to tell you a bit about Spanish history to explain why, but suffice to say, the idea of constitutional monarchy as we think of it uh, was born in the Protestant countries, and this is ironic because for a short period. Uh, the Protestant nations all had the most absolute monarchies that ever existed. Right. But what happened was that in fairly short order, depending on where you were, um, the oligarchies took control of their, of their particular countries and retained the monarchy primarily as a um, way of focusing national sovereignty and, and pride and patriotism on the part of the governed, while the oligarchs actually ran the show. Um, Belloc does a really good uh, description of this in his uh, House of Commons and Monarchy, which I recommend highly if you're a Belloc fan. What was the name of that book? The House of Commons and Monarchy. Okay, by Belloc. Um, 
it's it's he deals this very issue specifically uh, in time those oligarchies which in the beginning were noble they sort of morphed into bourgeoisie and all that and now they've turned into the kind of uh, ridiculous problems that run us everywhere uh nevertheless those monarchies a did the function of maintaining national pride etc b when they were gotten rid of uh, they were never replaced by anything better so you can take for instance the canadian monarchy and say it's very ineffective it doesn't it isn't what it should be uh the queen is queen of canada and her governor is general don't do this and that you're absolutely right but a republic of canada would be even worse um the same with the uk you know uh when uh, when the uh british legal system snuff little kids inevitably people get angry at the queen uh they never get angry at her for being unable to do anything else either they always focus in on that the truth of the matter is is that if the queen did try to intervene england would be a republic right it's really that simple um more important perhaps is why the catholic hierarchy of those countries never intervenes but they, oh i'm sorry <laughs> did i bring up an unfortunate reality yes i right, apologize exactly. but that then that's the other thing especially in the english-speaking world we tend to expect more out of the queen than we do out of hierarchy out of the church hierarchy you know yeah well, historically speaking what would be an example maybe a time and a place where you would say Catholic monarchy really uh, was set up correctly in the sense that the, the monarch really did have the, the proper amount of authority and power uh, in not necessarily even didn't necessarily even use it properly, but just what what uh, framework was probably one of the better Catholic monarch mon monarchical systems in the past. Well, sitting here in Austria, Hungary, I'd have to say Austria, Hungary. OK, of course. Like what time uh, frame for Austria Hungary? Like the 19th century? Yeah. Okay. The, uh, the the um, I would say that uh, that France under um, under well actually before the American Revolution messed things up for him. Uh, Louis XVI was actually putting together a very good package, which unfortunately our revolution derailed. Hmm. Uh, I would say. No, believe it or not, the papal states are usually pretty well run. Right. Uh, Spain, uh, under the uh, under the late Habsburgs of Spain. Okay. Um, unfortunately, Carlos the Third of Spain, the the first, well, the third Bourbon king of Spain, but uh, the first one to really try to alter things. He tried to apply the same centralizing policies that Louis XIV did in France, and they had mixed results. But he did. Carlos III of Spain did do something more extraordinary than any other monarch who ever lived. What's that? He founded Los Angeles. <laughs> is that <Somewhere. laughs> is that good or bad? I'm not quite sure if we're going to count as a positive or negative about him. This was a paid announcement by the Los Angeles Chamber of Commerce. Chamber of Commerce. Yeah, right, right, exactly. <laughs> now, I have, I want to, I want to give up a couple uh, arguments against monarchy, common things against, it. and this is one for the first one is one that I always, it's honestly my first instinct. Sure. When somebody starts talking about monarchy, is and, and I remember I read something pro monarchy from an Orthodox source and talked, and he's talking about the biblical basis of it, monarchy supported by the Bible, mm -hmm. and my first thought was 1 Samuel, and I want to read it here because I want you to respond to it. It's when the people, they want a king. They've had judges. They want a king. So this is in 1 Samuel 8, and it says, So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking for a king from him. He said, These will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and be his horsemen to run before his chariots, and he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands of commanders of fifties and some to plow his ground to reap his harvest and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his servants. He will take the tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and to his servants. 
He will take your manservants and maidservants and the best of your cattle and your asses and put them to his work. He will take a tenth of your flock and you will be his slaves. And in that day you will cry out because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves, but the Lord will not answer in that day. Now I see that and I immediately, I, I admit for the longest time, I've always thought that seems to be a condemnation of monarchy from God himself. So how is it that the cat, and obviously I know that Catholicism has endorsed monarchy for so long. How are those two things reconciled? I honestly would love to hear the, the reconciliation of that. <laughs> I'm glad to do it. It always helps to know a little bit more of the Bible than that one reference. Right. And in fact, the first man ever to use it, as a, because once upon a time, people knew the Bible better than they do now, uh, was Thomas Paine. Interesting. Who, as you know, Thomas Paine didn't believe in the Bible. Right. And John Adams recounts, however, having made that argument in uh, common sense, he laughed at how people ate it up when he himself didn't believe in the Bible. <laughs> That's, you know, it's always good to know history, too, to right. see where we get our references. But you have to see that in the light of Deuteronomy, uh, specifically 17, 14 to 16. Because, in fact, long before Samuel and the judges, mm -hmm. uh, God had made provision for the people of Israel eventually to have a king. And he said, listen carefully. Is, when what, is the, to, what verse is this again? Deuteronomy what? Deuteronomy 17, 14 to 16. Okay, great. When you come to the land the Lord your God is giving you, and take it over and live in it, and then say, I will select a king like all the nations surrounding me, you must select without fail a king whom the Lord your God chooses. From among your fellow citizens, you must appoint a king. You may not designate a foreigner who is not one of your fellow Israelites. Moreover, you must not, he must not accumulate horses for himself or allow the people to return to Egypt to do so. For the Lord said, you must never again return that way. So he was describing both the kind of king he wanted and the kind of king he didn't want. When it came up, it was obvious that the sort of king the people were after was the sort of king he had already said he wasn't keen on. Interesting. Also, you have to bear in mind that the reign of the judges had been very unstable. Right. Very problematic. We Americans know what being ruled by judges is like. We've had the Supreme Court doing it for us for decades. <laughs> so we know all power to them in heaven and earth. That's right. But uh, the truth of the matter is, is that the, how else do I put it, the abortive monarchy of Saul was nevertheless a necessary blip on the road to the Davidic kingship. Remember, nothing happens without a reason, and certainly nothing happened in the Old Testament without a reason. So God intended from the time at least the children of Israel were in the desert, he intended that they uh, they would have kings, but they had to be the right kings. Kings after his own heart, as he described David. And this is why, also, you remember Melchizedek, the priest king of Salem, mm -hmm. that very, very shadowy and mysterious figure. Well, he's seen as a, uh, a shadowing of Christ, who is also a priest king. Needless to say, he's king of king and lord of lords and not president of presidents and chief executive and chief executives. But that's, right. that's I wonder if I wonder if that first king Saul kind of works like Judas does for the apostles. It's not that we're not supposed to have apostles because some of them are Judases, because obviously we you know our Lord instituted the apostles and the bishops after them, but with the selection of Judas, it's kind of like, well, but guess what? Some of them are not going to be that great. Likewise, and, and, Paul yeah. is picked as the first king to kind of say, yeah, it's not saying, I'm not saying don't have a king, but what I am saying is, guess what? Some of them are going to be really bad. <laughs> no, and that's and that's the nature of things. I mean, uh, even as you had real bad popes and real bad emperors, you will always have, well, I mean, our Lord talks about the, the tares and the wheat. You know, it is an unfortunate part of our human fallen nature that anything, no matter how elevated and high, that we put our fingers to, we can, we're quite capable of wrecking. 
There's nothing so sacred we can't prostitute it. We're good at that. Our history shows us. Doesn't that make an argument somewhat? I'm thinking of Aristotle, and he, and I, I hope I don't, I, I think I get this right, but he definitely, a monarchy was a high form of government because you had, but a monarchy was defined as the single ruler who is ruling for the interest of the people. Mm-hmm. Whereas a tyranny is the worst form because it's a single ruler ruling for his own purposes. Right. And then you have in the middle there, you have the democracy and the. Um... Not quite, if I, if, I, if I may. Yeah, go ahead. In the, uh, in the middle, as you say, he's got three good governments and three bad governments, which are like right. the shadows of each other. The monarchy, the, the king rules for his people's sake and not for his own. The tyranny, where he rules for his own sake and the people are cattle. Then he's got the um, aristocracy. Aristocracy, right. Where the best people uh, rule for the sake of the whole, but right. not for themselves. And the oligarchy, where they rule for themselves and not and everyone else are cattle. Right. And then the lowest ring, he's got what he calls the polity. Right, polity. Is, that's the word I was looking for. Where you've got the, the majority of the quote-unquote stakeholders these are people who own something or, you know, fought veterans, whatever you like. The people, in other words, who contributed to society, the majority of them rule. And then, of course, the democracy, and they rule for the sake of the whole, not for themselves. And then you have the democracy where basically people are voting themselves racist. Right. Now, now, his idea was that the best form of government, and this was fulfilled in the medieval state that I uh, spoke of earlier, the estates and so forth. Um, the uh, ideal state would have the elements of all three of the best kind. So right. you would have the king, you would have an aristocracy, and then you would have a polity. And of course, the polity and the aristocracy in the medieval setup were represented in what were called the estates. The, the desiccated remnants of them you can see today in the House of Lords and the House of Commons of England. Right. Um, that was his idea of the best. What he never came up with, and what I don't think anybody until our time ever considered, was that you could come up with a kind of government that combined all three of the worst, where you could have tyranny, oligarchy, and democracy all working together to milk everything. That's uh, never I mean, you know, He had to admit, we're the best at, at something. There we go. <laughs> no, I, I, it's, it's, it's really special. But isn't it like there's something to be said for the fact that in one sense, monarchy may be the best, but tyranny may be the worst because tyranny, you have somebody with this authority and power to more efficiently be awful. Whereas at least in theory with democracy, it's, it's not as efficiently terrible. And I think that's I, one argument you could make that why, yes, monarchy might be better than polity, but tyranny is worse than democracy. So let's go for the middle. Does that make sense, kind of, that argument? It does if you only live in the world of theory. Yeah. <laughs> the problem is I'm an historian, and it, it doesn't quite work like that. What the problem you have is that in reality, the polity is far more easily turned to democracy. Uh, a, a, a population, and this will sound ironic, but a population are easier to dumb down and corrupt than a single man. I know that sounds weird, but mm-hmm. think about it. I mean, again, I, I, I hate to bring reality into any question, but you look at the, you look at our own country in the, uh, uh, the hot, hot summer of burning love in 2020. The vast majority of those mobs were not made up of evil people. Right. The, I mean, we really do not have the that that level of constant evil. But you don't need it. All you need is an evil leadership to guide the masses, and the masses will follow. Right. So to answer your question, what history shows us more often is that a popular regime of that sort, a poly, which they really haven't existed very often. 
And when they have, they usually have gone down the tubes fairly quickly because they're easy to corrupt. There's no way for the there's no way for them to defend themselves. I mean, look around you now. Um, who speaks for the people? Right. Who defends the people? Not, not them. And remember, too, that at any given moment in the world's history, at any time, the vast majority of people, uh, without a doubt, just want to be left alone. Right. Please don't beat me. Please don't steal my stuff. Please don't starve me. Please don't burn my house. Just please, could you just leave me alone and stuff? And yet, that very simple desire most often is stamped upon happily. Right. So, uh, you know, history is made by creative minorities, by determined minorities, for good or for bad. I mean, right. remember that the minute, the minute you say you're in favor of change, and I don't care what the change is, you might be right, you might be wrong. The minute you say that, you're inherently anti-democratic because the majority of people just want to be left alone. Hmm. You want to get rid of Roe v. Wade. You want to bring it in in 1972 when I was a boy. I can tell you, because I remember it, that was anti-democratic. Right. Today, getting rid of it, quite possibly, was anti-democratic. Yeah, I think the majority of people would did want abortion legal, at least on some level. Uh, yeah. I think that's uh, sadly true. And I think the exact opposite was true in 1972. In, in, in 1972, the vast majority wanted it kept illegal. Right, right. But now their, their sons and grandsons are different. Either way, whether, you're, whether you were anti-life in 1972 or pro-life now, you're not really democratic. Right, right. Now, I want to bring up something you've already said I'm going to bring up. You, you predicted it, and that is Henry VIII. And really, though, I want to ask about in a general sense of how do we how is it possible to keep a monarchy from degenerating into a tyranny where all of a sudden an absolute monarchy like what were the reasons why England wasn't able to keep uh, Henry VIII in check? Because I, you know, I've read, um, oh, I can't remember the guy who wrote it, the Stripping of the Altars book. No, the vast majority, like you said, the vast majority of the people in England wanted to be left alone. No. They didn't want to change anything. They wanted to go to mass each week. They wanted to do the same things they've been doing for centuries. And then all of a sudden, a hundred years later, the whole thing has been upended and you get killed for doing the things a hundred years before. And it was done through the power of. King Henry VIII, but more particularly Queen Elizabeth was the, the real, I mean, you know, it was under her name at the very least. And so how is it that that went so wrong and how is it that a monarchy can be prevented from that happening? Well, a couple of things to bear in mind. One is the, all, the uh, years ago, I heard the author of the stripping of the altars. Uh, who I, uh, I can't believe it. I've gotten, I've gotten dumb. His name, you know, it as well as my own. Uh, I know. I, I can't remember his name it's either. Somebody... It's Duffy. All right. E Eamon Duffy. Eamon Duffy. Yeah. Um, he was, I, I was sitting in on a uh, thing at Cambridge University where he was lecturing. And a, a Cambridge don asked him, well, if what you say is true, and the majority didn't want it, why did they go along with it? And he said, well, you know, the religion that I was raised with in the West of Ireland was virtually identical to that of England before the Tudors, before Henry VIII. And then, in when I was you know, when I was in my in the 1960s, the authorities said we had to change everything, and so we did. Most people didn't like it; we went along with it because people are used to obeying whom they're used to obeying. Now, I would I would take this a step further and say that probably the best man to ask how to avoid another Henry VIII is Pope Francis. <laughs> uh, the answer is you can't. Right. Things happen when they happen. Um, but as St. John Hughes says, and what he says of priests is true of kings and popes, that the most evident sign of God's anger toward his people is when he allows them to fall into the hands of evil priests. Hmm. Now, as to why there wasn't more 
open resistance to Henry? That's a very good question, and you have to go back in time. Remember that Henry's father had only taken over in 1483. Let's put this in perspective. This is now, right now it is the year of our Lord, uh, 1922, or, sorry, 2022. How long ago was 1983 to you? Yeah, man, that's 40 years ago. I, mean, I, was, I was a young boy. Yeah, and it's no time at all to me. I was 23. The Wars of the Roses had only ended in 1483. And they were a very bloody, nasty, horrible civil war. And a lot of people, regardless of whether they supported York or Lancaster, we're just glad it was over. Right. The problem with rebelling against the crown was that so many people still in living memory knew what could happen if the thing got upended. Remember what I said about the defect of the system being anarchy? Right. Now, Henry VII, in the meantime, had been centralizing. And although he was a devout Catholic, his son, uh, more more because of his gonads in his mind, right. uh, wanted to rule the uh, wanted to rule the show on his own. But even he pretended that he was going by the law, and he had scholars claim to discover old precedents. Any of this sounding familiar? Yeah. Really? I mean, that's funny. I wonder how. How come? Gee. That's odd. Hmm. Yeah, there's there is too many frightening parallels between the English Reformation and uh, the implementation of Vatican II. Frankly, no, that's because although uh, although the, as my late father used to say, the he was an actor, as well as World War II. I, I don't mind saying, but he used to say that although the uh, the names of the uh, although the names of the characters change, the roles never do. Right. The actors change, but the roles never do. I will say one thing that I, I feel like in recent years that has that makes you realize it's not a systematic fault with monarchy that doesn't exist elsewhere. This idea of going along with whatever the leader says is just look at 2020 that yeah. the masses were all shut down. All the businesses were closed. Everything just and, and what did the vast majority of people do? They just said, okay, we'll just and go what, along. We don't like it, they, but whatever. What were they supposed to do? Right. What kind of what kind of alternative leadership did they have? Right. I mean, you know, again, mutatis mutandis, it's like when people look at the uh, the, the quote unquote good Germans from nineteen thirty three and nineteen forty five. Why didn't they do more? Whenever I hear that, my immediate thought is, well, when I was a boy. The vast majority of people, as you said earlier, believed abortion was murder. And that's 50 years ago, 55 years ago. What if, and it's not impossible, in 55 years, everybody feels the same way? And they look back at us now, and not just now, but in the decades preceding. Why didn't we do more? Right. Who were these good Americans? Why did everybody go along with it? You know, I, I, I have to admit that one of the things that does drive me a little bit crazy, and there are a lot of them, so it's not a long drive, but <laughs> <laughs> when we examine history, we moderns inevitably assume a sort of moral superiority. Why didn't they do this? Why didn't they do that? The problem is that if you look at us, we look worse from their standards. Hmm. We, we, if you were to take their... And I mind you, there are many different periods, many different points of view. But if you were to take the average Catholic Christian of 1490 and have him look at us and what we do, he would be amazed by the wonders of technology, I'm sure. But beyond that, he would think that we were horrible, perverted, cruel, cowardly, nasty. And we are. Right. Uh, there, there's a, a line that uh, always cracks me up when I hear it, it, not in a nice way, modern moral sensibilities. When I hear that phrase, I think of the Madame of a Bordello, who's outraged that the girls might be smoking after work 
Oh, I, mean, I can smell the cigarette smoke. I know they're doing it. I know it. Well, that's how we modern, moderns are. Right. And we look at them. Oh, it's terrible. The monarchy, the crusades, the inquisition, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, blah, 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 indeed. Why don't you wipe some of the blood off your own hands and then we'll talk. Right. You know, when I was doing some research for before we uh, for this interview, I found it was interesting. There's a, a pretty well-known uh, libertarian, Hans Hermann Hoppe, yeah. and he makes the argument uh, that essentially monarchy is superior to democracy. And I thought the way he I'm gonna, I might not completely get the argument right, but I think I, I'm going to try to give the synopsis of it. And I thought it was very telling. But essentially, the idea that a monarch he looks to his country as if someone as the owner of it, and therefore he has to hand it on to future generations of his kids. And so it's like owning a house, uh, probably better be, say, maybe an estate, a mansion that you know your family's been living in, let's say, for the past you know, few hundred years, and you're going to give it on then to your kids. You're going to take care of that house. Yeah. Whereas democracy, you're renting an apartment. <laughs> And we all know that when we rent a place, yeah, we're not trying to trash the place necessarily, most of us. But at the same time, we don't really care if after we move out, if it all falls apart. And so we're not looking at any long term way of keeping it in, in check. We're just like, as long as it stays afloat while I'm renting it, you know, stay and, and everything's working. I don't really care that much long term. Do you think that's a good analogy for for kind of a defensive monarchy over democracy? Because that's not well, Christian or Catholic at all. <laughs> well, no, it's it's not, and there are there are good arguments that are not Christian or Catholic for it, and that's one of them. I mean, the the fact too is that a monarch uh, usually is trained for the job from childhood to rule. They're trained for it right. in a way that we just aren't. And there's the old joke that a, a president of the United States spends the first half of his term uh, trying to learn his job and the second half trying to get reelected. And then in the last four years, if he gets reelected, you find out what he's really made of, right. which could be anything, good, bad, or different. <laughs> uh, and then he's gone. And uh, it's funny, the, the Archduke Karl von Habsburg, who's the heir to the uh, imperial throne here, he made the comment that modern politicians, well, the politicians used to look no further than the next election. Now they look no further than the next press conference. Hmm. And this, this is quite true. The, the idea of long-term policies completely eludes our masters. I mean, the whole, the whole thing, you know, setting aside deep, dark conspiracy theories and all that uh, regarding the way COVID was dealt with. What if setting aside without necessarily denying them. What if the biggest part of the problem was that you had a whole bunch of people in power who came from a generation that was badly educated, doesn't know much, has little faith, no religion in other words, and was suddenly confronted with something that they didn't understand. And that the uh, the scientists themselves were divided about. Wouldn't their response tend to be ignorant and panicky? And then having made an ignorant response, wouldn't they be likely to just push it through and get nastier and nastier if you challenge them? Why, heavens to Betsy, that's what happened. Right. And the one of the biggest problems with it, incidentally, is that if we do have another black plague, something that's really awful, this was the the, the government's the cried wolf. Right. I, I thought that I thought that myself a few times that if we actually do have a, a real serious thing, most of us justly won't believe it. Because, no, half of us, half of yeah. us will be dead before we. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, I mean, I, I I can see myself being like, this isn't real. And I'm dead. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Poof. <laughs> because, I mean, I have a reason to say that because we've been lied to so much that you, you end up doing that. Um, yeah, and, you know, and of course, the other thing, too, because they can't set long term policy. The idea of actually putting together a real plan 
to deal with another black death is something that's simply not on their radar. Yeah, I can see like if co if something like when something like COVID happened in a democracy, I don't see how a a elected leader could do anything other than just go along with the panic. I mean, it would take somebody of such a high caliber of of just moral fiber and intelligence to understand what's going on. So it's ve- it'd be very difficult. But you could see how a monarch, yeah, a monarch could definitely go along too and just go along with the panic and do everything wrong and stuff like that. There's no question. But you could see a monarch being like, wait a second, I actually know what's best. I, I don't care. I'm not going to get out of office next time no. because everybody hates me today. Because I know in a year or in two years, they're all going to see I was right. And so I'm just going to go ahead and do it because I'm, I'm not going to get kicked out of office. I can't get kicked out of office. Is that no. That would be another way to look at it, um, practically speaking, today, if America, for example, was a monarchy. Well, now that, of course, that's a, the, an American monarchy is a horse of a different color, <laughs> as, as they say in The Wizard of Oz. Uh, <laughs> I, that's a whole other issue. But uh, it's, certainly, it's certainly true that a monarch would be able to say, all right, look, we've been through plagues in my family. Literally, we've done this before. How do we deal with it now in the modern world? And he could look at the way he could, he could select his advisors from amongst the brightest and the best and not be politically useful. What in God's name was Anthony Fauci doing right there? How did he get there? This was a man who, who uh, should have been on his ear when he messed up the AIDS crisis in San Francisco. Right, yeah. And, well, and a king would have been aware of the fact that he had messed up the AIDS crisis in San Francisco. Right. But he said, well, you know, he may be okay for a state government, maybe, but there's no way in hell he's coming to the capital. Yeah, no, right, no, no, exactly. no, we need, we need a doctor. My, my personal favorite, though, with Fauci, and I, to the day I die, I'll be grateful he said this, Anyone who attacks me is attacking science. Yes, right. Dr. I, uh, science himself. So that's I mean, who, how can you not like that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> now I wanna I wanna finish up with one last uh topic, and that is the relationship between Catholicism and monarchy. I mean, I know you've been talking about Catholic monarchies, but as a Catholic, what I mean, let me just ask you, should Catholics be monarchists? Well, uh, that depends on where and what they are. I mean, first, let's put it this way. Catholics should never be anti-monarchists. That's the first thing. Okay. Um, the, uh, the Irish, for instance, have, because of their horrible history, uh, are simply knee-jerk Republicans. And that's not really smart. Um, but, and of course, now that they've shown themselves uh, by voting in abortion and gay marriage. I'm not really interested in their views anyway. But, uh, you know, it, they did to themselves what the English could never do. So they've got nothing to say to anybody about anything right now. Maybe if they, uh, and, the, and the worst of it, the, to me, you, when you're speaking about monarchy, the, the, the worst of it was that when the, the crown, quote unquote, the British government, shoved abortion down uh, Northern Ireland's throats against the wishes of the orange men. Bloody Sinn Féin supported the crown on that. Hmm. So in other words, they're all for, they're, they're all against the crown, you know, except when it's coming to killing babies and then all oh, God save the queen, you know? Right. So the Irish thing, I love Ireland, which is why it kind of gets me a little annoyed. <laughs> you know, people you don't care about don't annoy you with the slightest. Right, exactly. But, uh, so that's the first thing. The second thing is that a lot depends on a lot of things. For Catholics in pagan countries like Japan, India, the United States, uh, more important than the form of government is converting the country. Because one thing you've got to bear in mind about Catholic monarchy, nobody sat around to design it. It wasn't like Philadelphia in 1789 it organically grew through the effect of the faith on pre-existing institutions. 
Theodosius the Great, uh, when he made the empire Catholic, was taking something that already existed. And it still took centuries and centuries for the institutions to catch up with the idea. Um, with us, I don't know what a Catholic America would look like. If we converted the majority of Americans to the Catholic faith, they became very, very devout. And this incidentally is one of the, um, I consider a, a empty struggle between quote unquote, post-liberals and integralists. You know, right. said, oh, you'd impose Catholic Sharia. I mean, I, if the United States were primarily Catholic, if a vast majority of Americans, of Americans were believing Catholics, this would happen in and of itself organically. It's one thing to talk about the, um, the uh, principles, the abstract principles now, which is fine. But if as and when it ever happens, it will happen organically. It will happen the way it did in Europe, the way it did in Latin America, the way it did wherever the faith becomes the majority. So would that mean an American monarchy? I don't know. Uh, bring me here in 500 years. I would say looking at historical precedent, the Catholic republics don't last very long. The only ones we know have been very transitory, usually from a Catholic monarchy to a pagan republic in between, short period. Uh, those places like Genoa and Venice and Switzerland that we look at as republics were usually oligarchies um, or aristocracies at their best. But even they would look up to the emperor ultimately Right. So they were not republics in our sense. Yeah, I would think the only way, I don't think you can get Catholic America. I think what you get is you get America to, to split up, to, to no longer become America, to be uh, secession, get various uh, areas of this nation into different countries. And then maybe one or two or more of those might be, might be uh, predominantly Catholic, predominantly Christian, maybe even predominantly Catholic. And then maybe something would happen. The, the, the problem is, again, we're looking, at, uh, we're looking at things in the short term. Right. Remember something very important. When our Lord died, the apostles and the disciples set out to conquer Rome. And it took them almost 400 years right. to do it. And they did it. Now, the Rome that they ended up converting was very different from the Rome they started with. And whether or not the United States survive or don't, who can say? Have you ever read a book called A Canticle for Leibowitz? Yes. Oh, yes. Well, remember what happened with them. The, because right. of, the, of the nuclear war, the country turned tribal. Right. And then it became sort of like a Renaissance Europe, and you had different states. And then by the end, it's, it's an empire. It's a monarchy, but it's basically the United States again. Right, right. Now, I don't know that anything, I mean, I've written a, a Pass Through Tomorrow novel myself, uh, which I don't expect anything remotely like what I write will actually happen. <laughs> but uh, nevertheless, it's important to bear in mind that the future is in the hands of God. We have to do the best we can with what we know in the immediate. Uh, I'll put this another way. I had lunch some years ago with a uh, French politician of the Catholic variety in Paris, where you tend to find them. And he asked me if I saw any hope for the future as a Catholic interested in politics. And I said, well, as a Catholic, I always have hope. I said, but there's more to it than that. I said, let's pretend that you and I are St. Ambrose and St. Augustine. And we're discussing the state of the empire and the church. To tell you the truth, it really doesn't look very good. Not at all. But there's no way, on the one hand, that you or I could ever have imagined Clovis. Right. But then on the other hand, if you, St. Ambrose, and I, St. Augustine, hadn't done what we did, there wouldn't have been a Clovis. Hmm. And you see, that is the game that Catholics in every generation are given. It's the one we're given. We're living in a certain particular historical time, which is very difficult to get a handle on, very difficult to understand. 
And in the midst of it, we have to try to save our own souls and do the best we can to forward the kingdom of Christ and evangelize. But that's been the case for every generation of Catholics that ever lived. Absolutely. I think that's a good, uh, I think that's a good thing to wrap it up on. Uh, how about you? Is there anything, uh, like, what are you up to these days? Uh, I know, of course, I, I want to recommend everybody again, Blessed Charles of Austria, Holy Emperor and His Legacy from Tan, Tan Books, right? Tan published yeah. that? We're yeah, I Tan. highly recommend that book. Um, I'm going, actually, in a couple months, uh, Charles and I will both be at a symposium for Blessed Charles in Dallas in October of 2022 we're recording this in august 2022 is there anything else uh people can find about what you're doing or follow anything you have coming up well yeah i'm going to be doing uh, i've got my podcast every uh that appears every monday uh off the menu i'm going to be doing a second podcast as well every week with virgin most powerful radio which will be oh. dealing with uh different episodes of church history triumphs and uh, defeats nice and then um I've got, I'm working now on a, on a book on the life of Empress Zita, who is, of course, Carl's, uh, Carl's wife. Um, a, my last book before Carl was on the Holy Grail, I recommend it highly, also from Tam. But the one before that, because of the topic today, was, is called Star Spangled Crown. And it's a novel about a future American monarchy. Um, and no, I, uh, I don't think things are going to happen the way I describe it. <laughs> Although... Certain things have happened that make people think it's prophetic, but it's not. It's just historic. Um, the um, other thing I'll just say to no particular end, uh, you can see, you can see my stuff at uh, what's that magazine you were? Oh, Crisis! I remember. Yeah. Uh, That's right. You're you're computing ever both Crisis and uh, your work is at One Peter Five at times, correct? One Peter, One Peter Five, yeah. the European Conservative. A lot of my stuff is at Tumblr House at Catholicism.org. And apropos of nothing in particular, I'm going to Ukraine next week. Well, we will definitely pray for that. Yes. Pray for your trip, that it all goes well, and that, uh, yeah, I mean, definitely. That's a troubled region, as we all know. Uh, well, I will put in links to all, try to put in links to everything that you mentioned uh, so people can find them and, uh, you know, purchase the books, uh, listen to the podcast, and, and things of that nature. i would be very, very grateful. Well, thanks, Charles. I really appreciate you coming on. And uh, I, I will say that my own views towards monarchy have shifted in just doing research for this and talking to you. Uh, and you never know, maybe one day I'll, I'll I, I actually have jokingly called myself a minarchist monarchist. I want a monarchy, but I want them to kind of leave everybody alone, you know, when they're doing it. So well, maybe that, I'll just stick that, with that. That, you see, is precisely the point of monarchy. I right. wrote a piece called um, Are You a Monarchist? which you'll find on the Tumblr House website. And I, I recommend it because we deal with, it deals with just these things. Um, the, uh, I'll leave you with this. A uh, friend of mine I've known for years, she had two buttons she picked up at a, uh, a fantasy convention. The one of them was the takeoff on go not to the elves for counsel, but they'll say both uh, yes and no. It said, go not to the surrealists for counsel. But they shall say both blue and hippopotamus, <laughs> which I'm sure is quite true. But the other, which is the apropos button, said, don't blame me. I voted monarchist. <laughs> there you go. Very good. Very good. OK, well, thanks, everybody, for joining us. Thanks, Charles, for being here. Uh, God bless on your trip to uh, Ukraine and hope that all goes well. And until next time, everybody, God bless.